Our reading from 1 Corinthians is a text that is read in worship services more often than any other. It appears as the words of institution each time communion is celebrated, but it is not often treated as a text for study and preaching. Reading these verses in their context in 1 Corinthians shifts to our understanding. They are not so much instructions about what to do in communion, but instead are Paul's response to a number of issues related to worship that he was concerned about. The Corinthians were allowing the social stratification that characterized their culture to shape the way they celebrated their common meal. Different sorts of people, those of higher or lower status, received different amounts and qualities of food and drink at these meals. Some people had so much wine that they were drunk, while others had to be content with so little food that they remained hungry. Paul's response was not to abolish social stratification. That would be, however, he tells them to share in the Lord's Supper in a way that demonstrates their unity rather than their divisions. And he retells the story of the meal that Jesus shared with his followers with a future orientation. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Our reading is 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 26. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. In this reading, we hear God's voice. What does it mean to remember? Memory is a fluid, liquid thing. It plays tricks on us. We remember to brush our teeth, to take out the garbage on the right day. We remember names, sometimes. We're frustrated when we forget things. We get scared when we forget things too often. On Remembrance Day, we say that at the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them, lest we forget. In Quebec, the license plate motto reads, je me souviens, I remember. Memory can be the nostalgia of fond memory, and it can be the the sudden realization that we remember things very differently from somebody else. Sometimes we want to forget, wish we could forget. We walk in someone's home and smell roast turkey and have a flood of memories of people, gatherings. We smell stale alcohol or a certain aftershave or perfume and are overwhelmed with painful, triggering memory. We remember the words to songs from 40 years ago, word for word, when we hear it on the music in the grocery store and sing along. <laughs> memory can be tricky terrain 
for many of us. And at the same time, it can be inspiring, a source of motivation, and at other times, a source of comfort. Today is about memory and story of a different kind still. An act of memory that makes the past present as future coming to birth. Memory not as past only, but as brought to life in the present and empowering a future, our future, God's future. In a world of continuous change, what does it mean to remember like this? Physicists understand time as a construct that keeps everything from happening at once. Storytellers arrange time, condensing it, expanding it to serve their narrative purpose. But like most of us, Jesus' early followers are constrained by time's linear flow. We live each moment as it occurs, one event after another. Unlike us, however, they lack the advantage of knowing the end of this particular story before it happens. We experience Monday, Thursday, and the story of that last meal together from the perspective of both sides of the cross. So while Good Friday has not yet happened, we live in the reality of Easter. The disciples experience these events only as they unfold. But in right of their growing understanding much later. Remembering our future is not a clever play on words. Well, it is, but it's more than just that. <laughs> It's what we say at communion when we gather. Writing to the Corinthians in the sixth decade of the first century, Paul gives us the first account that we have of Jesus last evening with his disciples and friends. And his description, like the similar gospel accounts that came later, shows how deeply this memory and practice shaped the early church. Paul sketches out the details with an economy of language that conveys the essence of the meal in very spare terms. And the words come to Paul from the tradition that the church has already begun to form, but he hands them on here because he's troubled. This is not about correct worship, getting the words and the order of things right. It's about how the memory and the reenactment of that meal equips us with a worldview and with integrity as we seek to be an alternative expression of human community in the world, then and now. Communion is about how we nurture our common remembering to carry us into a distinct future that is God's future, a future of justice, peace, healing, and wholeness. But you see, as Mary Ellen said with the reading, formal meals in Corinth were very structured and class specific. People of different social status did not eat together. From what we know about the life of the early house churches in Corinth, their gatherings too began with a meal that followed the usual social customs. Those of less status would dine in outer rooms or in the courtyard on less costly food on down to the servants who would not eat at all but only serve the others. In the case of the house churches, the final ritual would involve bringing together all of the people for sharing of bread and wine accompanied and explained by the words of institution that Paul gives us. What was accepted Corinthian practice was not acceptable to Paul. 
where common practice underlined social divisions, the words of institution declared, announced a new covenant, uniting the church into a single body, just like the one loaf that is broken and shared among them. When the Corinthians allowed social norms to infect their time together, the supper was not a meal that remembered Jesus in the body of the community as one. It was a private dinner. So simply put, God's future is not what's going to happen if the way we gather reinforces the class differences, the social stratification that divides us along lines that society has imprinted on us. These blind spots and subtle biases may be virtually invisible to us in our eyes, our ears, so normalized have they become, but they are visible to others and to God. And if we take the time to connect our values and practices to our core faith identity, we will see the contradictions too. So Paul tells the story again. So much more than a religious ritual, Paul is conveying to the Corinthians that their actions in sharing the common meal do this, are the place where their faith and their spirituality comes to be expressed. Beautiful, soaring celebrations of communion without awareness of hunger and hospitality to others is, Paul goes on to say, to share the bread and the cup in an unworthy manner. Paul's words tell us that remembering means to have our lives and our actions reshaped. When God remembered the Jewish people in exile, the result was mercy and return. To remember God in the Hebrew Bible is to repent and obey. For Paul to remember the poor in Jerusalem was not only to recall that they exist over there, but rather they became a life-changing concern for the whole church. That this meal is done for the remembrance of Jesus is not just so that we don't forget the past. We are met here once again by him and our lives are given new focus and impact in that moment in that experience, in that sharing. Our actions at the table are an act of proclamation. Coming to the table without distinctions is scandalous. It's unseemly. This witness to what the cross makes possible is what the church is called to proclaim until he comes. When all of this began for us in 1887 or in 1912, when George Pidgeon became the minister of Bloor Street Presbyterian, or in 1925, when the Presbyterian Church entered church union by a vote at Bloor Street Church, no one could have predicted that in, 19, that in 2024, the United Church would proclaim that we are a people of deep spirituality, bold discipleship, and daring justice, as we do in this centennial year and beyond. But our church founders had the foresight and the vision to know that we would need new expressions for each generation of the church to say and do its faith in fresh and faithful ways for that time for such a time as this. We as Bloor Street or as the United Church have never fully or perfectly been the revelation of God's love for the world. Our journey has proven both in spite of and because of God's grace that our human brokenness can never be the full expression of what is God's 
intention for us and for the world. God is always saying in the words of Isaiah, look, I'm doing a new thing. Can you not perceive it? God does not repeat the same thing over and over again. God is the creator. God is creative. God is innovative. God always creates new things. Be grateful for what God has done in the amazing 137 years is a beautiful thing to do. We're doing it. But God doesn't want us to stay where we are. At the same time, we cannot live as we have lived before and expect a different result, expect a change for changed times. God is always calling us, therefore, to set aside our human fallibility and limits and to make space for each other and for others to make space for love. When Christians remember we're not retreating to the past, we're being catapulted towards the future. God's people inhabit time in this strange to remember so that we can hope. Our traditions propel us toward the future with hopeful expectations. Christians inhabit time as the stretched people. You know, people speak today of paying it forward. When someone does something for you, instead of paying them back, you pass it on to another person, and so on, and so on. Perhaps as we discern what God's Spirit is saying to us today at Blur Street United Church, we can work to remember forward Remember forward who we have been as we live into who we are and all that we are becoming. May it be so. Amen.